Okay, we'll uh, begin after our break. So just before our break, we were looking at uh, the different learning styles. We're looking at the five um, learning styles, basically to our senses, um, hearing, seeing, touch, uh, smell, Yeah. So we and a uh, taste. Uh, so we looked at uh, auditory learners who are learners who learn by hearing. Uh, we looked at visual learners, uh, learners who learn by seeing. Now we look at um, uh, learners who learn by touch. Okay. Now, when you look at some children in, in your class, you would have noticed that. Uh, some of them just can't sit still, right? They would have come and sat here, then they would move to some other place, or, uh, you know, uh, they would constantly be fidgeting with something. They would get, uh, they'll take a pen or a pencil box, their water bottle, or uh, they'll be playing with their feet, um, uh, you know, or they'll bring a toy to class, a car or something, and they're constantly fidgeting and moving. and that can get you really annoyed, thinking that this child is really not interested uh, in my class. The child is really playing. But these are children who learn by touch. Okay, They want something in their hands constantly, they, or they need to be feeling something, touching something, doing something just to uh, you know, uh, uh, to make the learning happen, or that's how they are. So, you know, why not uh, give them something in the story that, uh, you know, some object in the story um, uh, in their hands in, by which they can touch it and, you know, they can identify, uh, they can, it, they can, it also can make their learning very engaging and they can also be listening to you and, you know, not disconnected, okay? Um, so if they are holding something, uh, the story that you are t narrating to them, then, you know, they're listening to you, they're connected with you, okay? So uh, let's look at some objects uh, that we can use and um, how we can connect them to various uh, stories in the Bible. Now, for example, if you take water, okay, I have some water in this glass, so maybe you can... Uh, you know, just pour a little water in the in in their on their hands. Uh, so, what can we use water for? Which narratives in the Bible when we're telling children? What are the narratives in the Bible that we can use water for? <coughs> Noah story. Okay, Noah. What else? Jonah. Okay. So what can we use water for? Uh, you know, you can just put water in their hand. So what is the water that we can use in various stories in the Bible, the narratives in the Bible? Jesus in the storm, yes. <coughs> Parting the first of the Red Sea, yes. The first, the, the first miracle at Cana. Okay, a miracle when Jesus turns water into uh, wine. I was going to say blood. <laughs> Jesus turns water into wine, yes. What else? <laughs> Baptism of Jesus. <clears throat> the Samaritan woman. You know, Elijah being fed by bread and water, jar of water. He drank water from the brook. You know, so you can, for all of these narratives, you can just uh, use, you know, water. Now, I just have here some um, rocks, okay? So I've just put some rocks here, okay? So what can we use rocks for? Yeah, Rosalind says, uh, name and dipping in water, yes. Okay, rocks we can use for David and Goliath. Okay, that is more like a smooth stone. So basically, when you're talking about David and Goliath, you can get some smooth stones. What else? <coughs> what can you use rocks for? There is that story of Jesus and uh, telling Simon, uh, telling Simon Bar Jonah that on this rock I'll build my church. Okay. Yes. <coughs> 
Okay, water from the rock. Thank you, Divya. There is also a story of the wise of the first builder, one on the sand, another one on the rock. Yes, so you can you have sand, you can use rock. Yeah, thank you, Lubega. Jeffina said the same thing. <laughs> so uh, Christ said that is the rock that was rejected. That's going to be the cornerstone. Yes, thank you. Divya says parable of the sewer. Yes. Temptation of Jesus, where you know Satan tempts him to turn the uh, stones into bread. Okay, stoning of Stephen. Uh, so you can use all of these for rocks. Okay, you can just give it to them in their hand, and they are, you know, they are engaging with you in the story, even as they are touching the rocks, feeling the rocks, or the stones, or the smooth uh, stones, and things like that. Uh, what about? Um, I have some grass here. Okay, so there's some grass here, and then I also have um, some flowers, some plants. So what can we use this? The really story where Jesus said that uh, Solomon, his riches, did not wear like one of them. Okay. <clears throat> the grass of the field will not wither, yes. What else can we use grass and plants for? The shepherd, okay, the good shepherd. Yes, thank you, Divya. Okay, look at the lilies of the field, okay. What else? There is the harvest story where the thorns will be separated from the wheat. Okay, so you can use wheat, yes. The chaff, you can use the wheat as well can get wheat to class, give it to them. So those who learn by smell, touch, taste, they can use these things. Creation story, right? God created the plants. Uh, what about Moses among the, uh, the river bank, the, the grass? I couldn't get long grass because it was all chopped off yesterday by the gardener here. So. Uh, you can get those reeds, you know, where he placed a basket. They went and collected those reeds to make the basket for baby Moses. So you can just get long grass. Uh, okay, Joseph's dream, where uh, his brother's uh, uh, sheaves were bending down to his sheaves. Okay, so maybe you want to make bundles of them and keep it. Okay, that's if you have the time. Great. What about bread? <coughs> What about bread? The Eucharist or the Holy Communion? Yes, Holy the Communion. Holy. Okay. You can get those who learn. The five loaves and fishes. Yes, the five loaves and two fishes. Thank you, Roslyn. Five Jesus, the bread of life. Thank you, Lubega. Jesus, the bread of life. What about Jesus feeding the 5,000? Five loaves and two fish. If you want to get fish to class, you can, you know. Um, okay, I have some uh, Dettol here and uh, a Band-Aid here, okay? So what can we use this for? Bandage, Dettol. Good yeah, the, good, the Good Samaritan. Uh, we can also have children who learn by smell, smell the Dettol. You know, uh, I have here uh, thorns. Okay, can you see these thorns on this stick? So, what can we use this for? The, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Yes. What else? Parable of the sower. Yes, you can use uh, those things. Uh, if you have seeds, you know, you can use it for the parable of the sower as um, well, okay? I also have here some uh, coins, a lot of coins, okay? So here are some coins. I don't know if you can see them, okay? Some we coins can, here. We can't, we can't see the toy very well. We can we see the coins very well? I can't see it. You can't see the coins, okay? Can you see them okay. now? Yeah. Yes, I can see them. Okay, so what can we use the coins for? So you can just place these coins in children's hand. What can we use the coins for? 
far are above the talents parable of the talents parable of the lost coin yes thank you divya yes the sorry, widow sorry. who put sorry go ahead and the in the mouth of the fish okay yes coin in the mouth of fish thank you success what else what can we use coins for roslin yeah the widow who put her last two in the office yes yes thank you <clears throat> <clears throat> Subhashish says lost coin, yes. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Okay, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, give to God. <clears throat> Sorry. Judas who sold Jesus for 30 pounds. Yes, Judas, yes. Very good. So keep it coming. More. Anything else? Prodigal son. Okay, you can use it to explain tithes. Prodigal son, he used took the bag. So, you know, I have a bag of coins here. It's very small, but you know, a uh, small pouch of coins. Zacchaeus, tax collector. Yes. Akin, Akin sin, Akin. You know, he when Jericho when they went to fight Jericho, he took coins and he hid it. Uh, Elijah's greedy servant Gehazi, who finally caught Naaman's got Naaman's leprosy. So you can use, um, you know, all of these um, uh, objects. I'm just showing you a few of them, but uh, as just as an example, it's so easy. I hardly spent uh, even five minutes just picking this up and having it accessible. So I'm just saying how easy it is for you to have these for the children in the class. But uh, please note that not all children will want to touch because there are only some children who learn by touching. So if they don't want to, don't force them. You can just give it to who wants to, who loves to, so that they keep touching with it, playing with it, you know, and doing what they want, even as they're engaging with you in the class. And they will really appreciate that you're mindful of their learning style and that you've taken all the pains and the effort to make the learning engaging and interesting for uh, them. Okay. Uh, any questions so far through uh, to any of these points that we learned? Learn uh, auditory learners, uh, visual learners, and those who learn by touch. Okay. Any questions, any queries, any doubts? So far, so good. OK, thank you, Lubega. So we'll move on. Uh, learn, learning by smell, OK, learning by smelling. Uh, did you all know that an infant's bond with their mother, the first bonding of an infant uh, with their mother is to the sense of smell? Did you know that? Did anyone know that? An infant's first born with their uh, bond with their mother is through the sense of a uh, smell. You know, it's it's just so powerful how and how unique God has um, uh, created us. You know, um, they say that you know the um, uh, when newborns have a keen sense of smell and they're able to recognize and distinguish their mother's scent shortly after birth and this bond is you know uh, uh, is uh, actually facilitated by the baby's ability to pick up this unique smell of the amniotic fluid that the baby was in all these nine months and the and the mother's skin you know during pregnancy and uh, the scent of the mother provides a sense of comfort and a familiarity to the uh, baby so that's just so powerful okay um so we see that, uh, you know, uh, the sense of smell is so powerful. Just imagine how powerful smell can be in creating hooks for children uh, to learn Bible stories or to learn Bible truths or Bible concepts. And uh, it's not as hard as we think it might be, uh, thinking how can I bring uh, the sense of smell into my lesson. Um, here are some easy ideas. So, for example, I just I just showed you some um, some grass here. You know, you can just get them to uh, smell the grass, or you can have some uh, flowers. I just have this flower. Uh, 
it has doesn't have much smell but you know a little bit um, so you can use uh, you know fresh flowers uh, bring some of them to the class and then you can uh, what can you use fresh flowers for learning by smell what which narratives can you use them for garden of gethsemane yes garden of gethsemane good garden of eden yes you can use that as well okay uh, you can use vinegar for which story narrative in the bible when jesus was thirsty they gave him vinegar right so you can have vinegar they can smell i have a, a fragrant candle here um, so you can bring this fragrant candle to class and then you can just light it up so what can we use this fragrant candle for jesus the light of the world okay wiseman's gift of frankincense myrrh yes uh. yes frankincense and myrrh yes the gifts that the wise men brought actually i remember my uh, i mean uh, this christmas was a little uh, exciting for me because my sister had got me from bath and body were uh, bath and body she had bought me uh, uh, a body wash which had uh, frankincense and myrrh so you know and i used it during christmas and as it, it just kind of <laughs> brought the whole thing just so alive for me that just the fragrance it was just quite exciting uh, yeah so uh anything else we can use uh, this fragrant candle we are aroma of christ telling children you know when they come to class you can burn these fragrant candles and then you can talk about how you know we are a, a aroma of christ or we are the light of the world and how god uses us uh, to spread his light so powerful and the aroma we can, it just smell you can ask hey there's some nice fragrance coming in this room and then you can talk about you know how they can be that same fragrance and aroma for christ wherever they uh, go right sorry the ten virgins okay i have a perfume bottle here okay so what can we use this perfume for maybe for those who like smell you can spray it on them you know uh, alabaster jar yes the alabaster jar the woman who shows her love for jesus the fragrance so you can bring this uh, bottle to class spray it on the children i remember i i went to a, when i was teach, uh, teaching in schools quite recently i talked about um, uh, you know samuel anointing david and i'm actually taken an, a bottle of oil and um, you know and i had 10 10 people stand 10 children stand there and you know i looked at each one and described each one of them and they were so excited uh, you know uh, because you're talking about something that that nobody would have expressed to them and then how god did not accept them um, um but and then i you know every time samuel went to open he and i i would open the oil and i would literally pour and god would say no wait samuel this is not the one and then i would close the bottle and in the end everybody want all the children wanted oil on their palms and they wanted to smell it so so many of them came running and i realized how powerful this this whole uh, activity had and uh, uh, the immense uh, you know um, excitement it caused for them and i had to pour the oil on everybody's palm and they were smelling it and they were just super excited about it okay so you can uh, get uh, perfume to class i also have some uh, fruit here so i have um, pomegranate and i also have some Uh, grapes here so what can we use these various fruits for fruit of the spirit okay wine and the branches yes the wine and the branches you can use uh, this uh, actually yesterday i went um, uh, to see a land and there was a vineyard there and just was so excited to see the the wine and the branches and the grapes hanging uh it's just so exciting yes yeah anything else fruits and vegetables fruit of the spirit vine and the branches cane and abel yes bringing their offering yes good the garden of eden yes you can use that for creation as well okay I have some um, vitamin here. Okay, so vitamins, and I have uh, 
uh, medicine here. So what can we use it for? Sorry? Jesus is our healer, yes. The Good Samaritan, okay, you can use that. You can use these, um, uh, this fresh fruit that I have bought also for the fruit of the spirit. You can connect each of them, each of the fruits for each fruit of the spirit, okay. Uh, I have an apple cinnamon uh, scented oil here, which you can just put in a, uh, in a candle and, you know, burn it. And uh, the fragrance just... Uh, uh, you know, fills up the whole entire space of the uh, room. So what can you use this scented oil for? Anointing, okay. The parable of the ten virgins, the ten maidens, you can use that, right? Okay. Uh, you can also use a garbage bag, um, you know, and you can talk about sin how this garbage bag is so smelly, so stinky. You can have it outside the class. Anyone wants to go and look at it, you know, these children or, you know, the smell is really bad. And you can tell children sin is like this. You know, sin is like this garbage bag, so dirty that we don't even want to bring it in class and, you know, cannot relate to others and cannot be here. It should be removed. So you can tell them how Jesus has forgiven us. And then you can have a clean garbage bag inside the class and you can say how this garbage uh, bag is eligible to stay here in this classroom. So how Jesus has removed our sin and how he has made us worthy. Okay. So you can use that as um, well. Now we we'll move to the last um, uh, sense of learning, learning by tasting. Okay. So you can use various food for children who love to taste and experience uh, the, uh, the learning experience. Uh, some food that represents something very concrete in your story. So just a few ideas. You can use, uh, you know, there are various animal cookies available. So what can you use them for? Creation. <clears throat> Okay, Daniel, the lion's den, you can use it for Noah's story, right? Um, what about seeds? Seeds. Parable of the sower, yes. To explain faith, mustard seed you can use, yes. Creation as well. You know, you can talk about that. Then you can have uh, various fruits and you can give them these fruits and get them to uh, taste it as well. So what can you use these um, uh, fruits for? You can use an apple or just any fruit. You can use it for the first sin, right? The fruit of the spirit. Um, uh, what about grape juice? Communion, yes. Hello, everyone with me. What about grape juice? Yeah, Jesus turning the water into wine, okay. So you can give for children in, you know, you can have small cups like this. And in, in these small cups, you can just put some grape juice and give it to them and they can drink and they'll be super excited. Uh, you can also use mixed color candy. Okay, you can bring a lot of mixed color candy the MMM, so for us it's gems, you can bring them and you can use it for what? Color candies, what can you use to teach? What concepts can you use to teach? You know, Joseph and the, his many coat of colors, okay? Uh, uh, the rainbow, yes, you can use uh, for the rainbow as well, okay? Um, you can use it for uh, that, you know, even though we are all different, God created us all different, but, uh, you know, we are all unique and special, okay? We are valuable. What about bread? We can use it for Jesus, the bread of life, you know, Jesus feeding the 5,000, Elijah and the widow at Zarephath, Okay. So these are just simple, um, you know, um, uh, ideas that I'm giving you. You can, you know, uh, use these when you're teaching and you can, um, this way you can, you know, use all of the five senses in your uh, teaching. Okay. Any questions?
Any questions? I just had a question, ma'am. Uh, yes. So when we are using this, uh, these different props and all, is there something that we need to be, you know, aware or careful about? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, especially when uh, you're using, doing science experiments, you know, and uh, children who learn by doing, children who learn by seeing, you need to be very careful. You need to tell them, you know, uh, they should not be doing this. For example, you know, uh, we teach them uh, using a balloon, uh, you know, a balloon and you, you blow up the balloon and keep it over the candle and you can say, uh, we'll talk about this when you're doing object lessons. You can say this balloon uh, resembles us, you know. Um, and if we don't have God in our life and we go through problems and difficulties, this candle is, uh, resembles the problems and difficulties that we go in li through life. And when we face those problems and difficulties, sometimes we can be broken, we can give up. So when you keep that balloon over that candle flame, what happens? It bursts, You're right? But you can say when we have uh, God in our lives, so you can have another balloon that's blown up and you can put water in that balloon and tie it up. And when you keep the same balloon with the water in it, um, you know, over the flame, it does not burst, you know. Uh, so you can say this, this water in this balloon represents the Holy Spirit or, you know, God. And when God is in our life, the Holy Spirit is in our life. So we can face challenges and difficulties, but we can overcome it. But you need to tell children, hey, be careful, you know, don't go home and do all of these things. You know, it can be a little dangerous. Um, we're doing this in the class. Uh, um, but, you know, you can get them to help you. But then you can say, you know, I helped you. I was here to supervise. So don't uh, try these things out. So maybe those things you can tell them. But if you're giving some things for children to eat and they're allergic to it or maybe they don't like it, then you need to be very careful. You need to just check with them whether they like it or not first. Yeah. I think other than that, you can just be a little careful. They're not using anything that's going to really harm them or hurt them. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, uh, we'll move on to, you know, uh, the eight uh, intelligences or the seven types of intelligences, basically eight of them, you know, uh, presented to us by Howard Gardner. Now, Howard Gardner is an American, <coughs> sorry, an American psychologist and he's a professor and he's best known for his theory of um, multiple intelligences. And uh, Gardner's theory of uh, multiple intelligences say that people can be smart in different ways. It's not just about just being good in math or good at reading, good at studies, but uh, <coughs> he says there are many different areas they can be smart in. Like uh, some of them can be, uh, you know, good with words. Some of them can be good at music. Some of them good at sports. So each one of us are uh, differently smart in different areas. And he calls these smartnesses as intelligences, you know. But I've just named it as seven gifts of learning. Uh, that's how God has gifted us, the different ways of learning. But he calls it the seven uh, intelligences or his theory of multiple intelligences. So he says, for example, you know, some people can be really good with words. So those who are good with words, they like reading, writing. Uh, they express themselves well with words. And that is what he calls as linguistic intelligence. Then others might be good at playing instruments or singing. And he calls them as musical intelligences. And he says some people are great in understanding how things work or look in space, in an open space. You give them an open space, they can imagine what fits best where, what can be used where, and they can visualize things well. And he calls them as spatial uh, uh, intelligences. And it's important uh, to note that not everyone uh, has the same intelligence or the same uh, you know, uh, 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 not everyone have the combina same combination of intelligences. We're all different. We are wired differently. God has created us all differently. So each one of us have a unique combination of one or more of these intelligences. So some people might be really good at one or two types, while others might be good at different ones. 
um, it's basically like having this toolbox here in this picture. Let me just show the toolbox. You know, in this toolbox, uh, you know, there are various tools, right? But can you use all these tools for painting a wall? No, right? You want to put a, a, a nail in the wall, you, you don't use a paint brush or don't use a roller, right? You use a hammer or you use a drilling machine there. Uh, you don't use a saw to, <laughs> you know, put a nail uh, uh, in the wall. So, you know, um, in the same way, you know, we are all uh, very, very uh, different, you know. Um, uh, we all have our, just like this toolbox with many different tools. Each tool is useful in its own way. Uh, in the same way, you know, we all have different combinations or intelligences. And when it's catered to, you know, learning happens uh, well. So Gardner's theory helps us understand that, you know, being smart is not just being good with academics, uh, just being good at specific subjects in school. It's basically about recognizing and appreciating all the different ways people can be intelligent. Okay, So by understanding this, uh, teachers can find different ways to help students learn and succeed based on their individual strengths and their talents and their intelligences or their learning styles. So Gardner basically proposed, initially he proposed seven types um, of intelligences in his book uh, in, the, in 1983, Frames of Mind, the Theory of Multiple Intelligences. And these intelligences are linguistic intelligence and basically uh, linguistic intelligence is, uh, has to do with the ability to use language effectively both spoken and written then we have no no don't show that just show that slide yeah then we have logical or mathematical intelligence uh, the capacity for logical thinking reasoning and problem solving then we have musical intelligence um, the ability to appreciate, compose, and perform music. We have spatial or spatial intelligence. It's the capacity to basically perceive and understand, um, you know, or manipulate visual and spatial uh, or spatial information. Then it's the bodily kinesthetic intelligence, which is the ability to control one's body movements and handle objects skillfully. Uh, uh, interpersonal intelligence is the skill to understand and interact effectively with others. And then we have the intrapersonal intelligences, which is, uh, you know, self-awareness and understanding of one's own emotions, their own motivations and their own strengths. Okay. So we look at these and we study these in detail and we can, we'll see how as children's church ministers or Sunday school ministers or teachers, how we can inculcate all of this in our uh, teaching methodology. Uh, later on, we see that Gardner uh, added additional intelligences, such as a naturalistic intelligence, which is the ability to understand and recognize patterns in nature. And then also the existential intelligence, which is the ability to ponder uh, philosophical and um, existential questions. Okay. Now, Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences has had a significant, uh, you know, impact on education and has basically challenged the traditional uh, notion of intelligence that is solely measured on IQ tests. You know, we can say, okay, this child is intelligent because, you know, they get these grades, they get these marks. This child is not intelligent because this child doesn't do well in academics. It just loves to play, run around, discuss with others, uh, <clears throat> you know, music. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, um, P, um, his, his uh, theory of multiple intelligence had such a significant impact on education that it basically opened up avenues to recognize people's uh, intelligences and how we can cater to their intelligences and their learning styles. So according to Gardner, you know, individuals have different strengths and learning styles. 
And he says that education should basically aim to accommodate and develop these various intelligences. And so we see that in our present educational system, these things are slowly coming up. Parents are more opening up to children doing things that they like, whether it's music or, you know, not just being doctors and engineers, but uh, and teachers and professors, but also in various other fields. Okay. Uh, we look at each one of these intelligences in detail. We study this in a little more detail and see how we can incorporate that in our teaching method methodology. Before that, anyone has any questions? <coughs> Thing you like to ask all of you in class with me yes no okay thank you Roslyn thank you Zelatoli yeah we look at uh, uh, linguistic uh, intelligences okay now this intelligence is basically refers to the ability to use language uh, effectively so uh, individuals, people who are strong in linguistic intelligence are good with words. They enjoy reading, writing, enjoy storytelling, you know, uh, uh, script writing and, uh, you know, acting out because it has to do with words. Uh, they have a knack of expressing themselves verbally and, uh, you know, they enjoy debates, discussions, uh, such things. Okay. So what do you think can, uh, can be the subjective, uh, suggested activities for this type of intelligence? What can you use in your classroom teaching to cater to this intelligence? Okay, puzzle games, word search, puzzle games. Okay, what else? What are the suggested activities for linguistic intelligence? Memory games, okay. Comprehension. Okay, writing, you mean writing down what they have uh, understood, comprehended? No, uh, I was just like, um, like uh, if, if we narrate the story, whether they are able to like, narrated back to us yes okay okay storytelling uh, recalling information yes you no know, group discussions debates they'll be the first one you know when you ask a story uh, when you ask a question they will be the first ones to answer uh, writing assignments you know um, also you know you can get them to act out by saying dialogues and be quick to just, you know, say those dialogues. Uh, and also, um, uh, you know, st writing stories, uh, keeping journals in which they journal everything. So uh, these kind of uh, intelligences can, uh, you know, uh, do all of these things. So you these can be suggested uh, activities um, for them. Okay. Um, you can basically utilize vivid and engaging storytelling techniques, use expressive language for them, vary the tones, pitch, you know, emphasize key points, uh, encourage open discussion about the story. Why? The, what do you think the person was feeling? Why did the person say what he was saying, doing what he was doing? You know, they will express their thoughts verbally, these linguistic learners. And like Jafina said, you know, uh, Bible-based games, quizzes, crosswords, puzzles, also encouraging them to memorize uh, uh, memory verses, uh, recite Bible verses, uh, which can be very, uh, they can be very good at, okay? You can also get them to read from the Bible passages. You know, when you ask anyone wants to read, they'll be the first ones to uh, read so they can benefit by reading and also asking them okay what did you understand from this passage okay uh, uh, they'll be very good at that um, and this will basically promote uh, engaging them and enhancing their linguistic styles also creative writing keeping journals like I said okay um, you can also get them to enact these uh, Bible stories. You can also have a PPT with the uh, image and you can tell them, hey, uh, why did I show you this toolbox? How does it connect with what we are uh, learning today? 
Okay, so you can show them visual aids, captions, slideshows, posters, and you can get them to think and say what, you know, why you're using that or what it, how it identifies with the class or the concept that you are uh, teaching them. Okay, um, you can also pose various questions. You know, post question that the prompt students to articulate their thoughts and their interpretations and, uh, you know, stimulate verbal communication that deepens their understanding. Okay. So I hope this helps for linguistic uh, intelligences. Okay. The next one can is logical and mathematical uh, intelligence. So what do you understand by logical and mathematical intelligence? Problem solving, okay. When we talk about logical and mathematical intelligence, what are we talking about? Even as we are, uh, you know, talking about these five senses of learning, which we just looked at, and also these various uh, uh, eight intelligences, we need to remember this is not just uh, limited to children. It also involves us, okay. So you can also find out what is your intelligence, your learning style as well, and it can help you. And if you are a parent, if you are a teacher, you know, uh, or if you're trying to get your team to, uh, you know, understand this basic project, then how can you, what are the type of intelligences you have in your group? Or when you're preaching to an audience, what type of intelligences you have in your group and how you can cater to them in your preaching, in your teaching or in your team meetings also. So this is also for us as uh, uh, adults and grown ups. Okay, so, so don't think, hey, I'm not going to be teaching children, so I don't need this. This can help you understand yourself better, understand your children theme. And if you're a preacher or teacher, you can use it as well. Okay, so what does ma logical and mathematical intelligence uh, involve? Reasoning. Sorry, you said listening, Divya. Reasoning. 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 Okay, sorry. Reasoning, yes. Reasoning. Thinking logically. Uh, and like Jafina said, problem solving. So individuals who are strong in logical, mathematical intelligence enjoy puzzles, patterns, numbers. They're good at analyzing the problem. They're good at finding solutions. So when you're narrating um, uh, a narrative or a story or an incident in the Bible, you can get them to analyze and to say why the person behaved like this, why they did what they did, why they said what they did, and what they should have done. Okay, so they will be quick at, uh, or if you're throwing a case scenario at them, you're giving them an example, you can ask, and these are the ones who will be, you know, giving you all the um, answers. Okay, so engage them in a logical uh, learning, uh, you know, a logical structure of Bible verses, which means analyzing the meaning of the Bible uh, memory verse and the context of the verse, why it was written, the way that was written. So they will be able to, you know, logically uh, reason and understand. You can also uh, encourage these kind of uh, intelligences or these kind of students to compare and contrast different Bible stories. Okay. And uh, help them to identify logical patterns and connections. Okay. Now, do you remember elsewhere where God you know, did the same thing or the same nature of God that we see, the same attribute of God that we see, or someone else who did the similar mistake and what was the consequences. So these will be able to, con uh, you know, uh, identify these uh, kind of patterns and connections. Okay. Uh, you can also pose thought provoking questions that would require an, an analytical thinking and, uh, you know, ex encourage these students to explore different angles of uh, biblical concepts. So even when you're preaching or you're teaching, you can also, you know, in your preaching, teaching, pose these questions. So those who are logical, mathematical, intelligent, have in, um, logical and mathematical intelligence, suddenly they'll wake up, you know, because you've asked a question, repeat the question, and they will be thinking. So they're getting back with you on what you are preaching and teaching uh, to them. So you're keeping them in the in the loop as well. 
Okay. Uh, you can also use uh, visual aids like story uh, story maps, you know, and sequences of, you know, uh, Paul traveled from this place, this place, this place, this place. So some people will not be interested, but these uh, logical mathematical intelligences will be very interested. You can also use uh, chronological sequences of events in the Bible. And you can talk about the pattern, why God did this, uh, what was the importance of this chronological events that happened. Um, and you can trace it back from Genesis right up to Revelation. They'll be very, very interested. Okay. Also discuss biblical miracles and encourage uh, logical um, uh, learners to explore the rational aspects of these events. Okay. They'll be rationally trying to you know, uh, visualize, think, reason out, you know, and uh, how did this miracle come about and all of those things. But uh, they will finally be able to see it's a miracle and it was something supernatural and Jesus did it to the power of the Holy uh, Spirit. Okay. You can also use numbers in the Bible, um, you know, uh, and teach them the importance of the numbers, especially seven and all of the other numbers that are there. Uh, you can teach them. Also, you know, the parables, uh, highlight parables, mathematical parables, like the parable that involves mathematical concepts, parable of the talents, and all of this will appeal to their logical mind. Uh, they will quickly get back and listen to you, and, you know, their mind uh, will kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, calculate things and give you the answers. Also, debates uh, be, uh, work well with these kind of um, intelligences. So encourage debates on moral and ethical questions. It will help uh, these preteens and teens, even uh, grade five and six can benefit, you know, uh, four, five, six. Uh, so debates on moral and ethical questions that can be raised. And um, uh, basically, these logical learners, you know, uh, enjoy constructing and deconstructing arguments. So present an argument, they like constructing or deconstructing it. Also have uh, pose open-ended questions that prompt logical thinking. For example, you know, you can ask, in what ways did uh, da David demonstrate courage and faith in God, you know, when he encountered uh, Goliath? Or... Why do you think the Israelite soldiers uh, were initially afraid to confront Goliath? And what changed when, uh, you know, David volunteered? And when David killed Goliath, why did they all rush and kill all the Philistine, uh, chase the Philistine soldiers, and why did they kill them? What was the change? So these kind of learners, when you pose these open-ended questions that prompt logical explorations and thinking, they will be super excited um, and they will think and they will be with you whether you're preaching or teaching and even when you are teaching uh, children in uh, children's church okay also you can um, you know bring about real life applications real life situations present various scenarios that require logical problem solving you can present case studies uh, and encourage them to for logical analysis, um, you know, and discuss the decisions made by all of these biblical figures that you're studying in the Bible and the logical implications of the choices and the decisions they uh, made. That can be very engaging for uh, <clears throat> them. Also, you know, games that require strategic thinking based on biblical content, puzzles and quizzes and everything uh, will be very, very exciting for them as well. Okay. So this is how we can cater and help uh, people and children as well who are logical and who have logical and mathematical intelligences. We'll stop here. We'll look at the rest of the uh, six um, next class. Anyone has any questions? Any questions anyone has? No questions? Is it helpful, all of you? Are you with me in class? Yes. It's very helpful, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Lubega. Thank you, Subhashish, Salatodi, Jeffina. Okay. We'll end class here. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a blessed week ahead. God bless you. I'll see you on. Friday for uh, Timothy.
PTP class. Yes, thank you.